Hafiz TV, the solution for humanity. All of you are from Adam and Adam was from dust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, have the fear of Allah as he deserves. And all of you combine together, join hand, hold fast and tight to the rope of Allah. And don't be disunited. Don't splinter up into groups. Bismillah. In Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, he was salatu was salamu, or ala rasulillah, he was ala alihi, or as habihi, ajma'in. Woman said, Be our home be ahsan in ilal yomi deen. Assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatu. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God Almighty be with all of you. We welcome you all, brothers and sisters, to the Peace Conference. I'd like to invite onto the stage Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Sheikh Yasser Qadi is a lecturer and Islamic orator who has authored several books about Islam. He is a popular speaker in many Muslim circles in the United States, Canada, England, and Australia. He is one of the few people who has combined a traditional seminary with Western education. He was born in Houston, Texas in the USA and he went to high school in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia and he worked for Dow Chemical in a short stint while in the kingdom. He then decided to pursue an education in Islamic studies and left for the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. There he completed a second bachelor's degree specializing in the studies of hadith the narrations and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad and then he went on to complete his MA in technology. Presently he's completing his PhD in Islamic studies at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Apart from his studies, he's an active instructor in the Al Maghrib Institute and the Al Kawthar Institute. He appears on a number of Islamic satellite channels where he teaches theology, seerah, tajweed and many other topics. He also gives regular Friday sermons and lectures. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In a very beautiful hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, it is narrated that a certain person by the name of Abu Idris al Khawalani. He visited the city of Damascus for the first time. And when he entered the masjid of the city, he saw a person there with a shiny forehead and a bright face and eyes that had kuhul, that had the black kuhul in them. And he said, as soon as I saw him, as soon as I saw him, my heart opened out to him and I felt a bond a love, a brotherhood with this person. I asked the people in the masjid, who is this person sitting in front of us? Who is this man? They said, he is Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so Abu Idris sat and listened to his lecture. And the next morning, this was in the evening, the next morning, he came early in the morning trying to beat Mu'adh ibn Jabal to the masjid so that he could precede him. But he found Mu'adh ibn Jabal standing and praying to Hajjud even before Abu Idris entered the masjid. So he sat there waiting for 
Mu'adh ibn Jabal to finish the tahajjud. And when Mu'adh ibn Jabal turned around, he saw this Abu Idris sitting there. And he said, yes, what is it? Meaning, what are you doing here? And Abu Idris, the first thing he said after saying the salam, he said, O oh Mu'adh, I love you. I have this bond with you. I feel this connection with you. Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, what for? Meaning, I don't even know you. Who are you? How can you have this bond with me? Abu Idris responded, for the sake of Allah, this bond exists. In other words, this feeling that I have for you, Allah has placed it in me. I have this special connection with you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to establish this connection with my Muslim brothers. So Abu Idris says, Mu'adh held me by my collar and he dragged me closer to him. And he said, do you swear by Allah this is true? Abu Idris said, I swear by Allah this is true. Mu'adh repeated again, do you swear by Allah this is true? The only reason you have this feeling for me is for the sake of Allah. You don't want anything, no worldly reason, no money, no. It's for the sake of Allah. Abu Idris for the second time said yes. For the third time, Mu'adh ibn Jabal asked him to swear by Allah. And for the third time, Abu Idris said yes. After which Mu'adh said, if this is the case, then rejoice. Rejoice. For let me tell you a hadith that I heard from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is called a hadith Qudsi, where the Prophet sallallahu says, Allah says. The Prophet sallallahu said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who love one another for my sake, I have obligated upon myself to love them. It is obligatory upon me to love Muslims who love each other for my sake. And those who visit one another for my sake, it is obligatory upon me to love them. And those who do good to one another for my sake, it is obligatory upon me to love them. Allah is speaking, He is saying, wajibat, wajib. It is obligatory that I love two Muslims who visit one another, help one another, have feelings of camaraderie and brotherhood and friendship with one another only because they are Muslims. They both believe in Allah and His Messenger. If Muslims have this love, Allah says it is wajib for me to love them. Abu Idris became so happy when he heard this hadith. He became so overjoyed that as he rushed out of the masjid, he wanted to tell everybody he met about this hadith. And it so happened that the first person that he met was Ubadah ibn as samit who was another companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Now Abu Idris is not a companion. He is a student of the companions. He was with Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He rushes outside, he meets another companion, Ubadah ibn as samit And he says, do you know what I have just heard from Mu'adh ibn Jabal, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Allah ta'ala about brotherhood. Ubada said, wait, before you tell me this, let me tell you what I heard directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a beautiful hadith because it combines two hadith. Abu Idris, Allah blessed him to hear two separate hadith in the same incident. One in the masjid, one out the masjid. Ubada said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah says, this is also Hadith Qudsi, two Hadith Qudsi about the same topic in one incident. And this is a beautiful Hadith because of this reason. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on the day of judgment, those Muslims who loved one another for my sake and cause, who established bonds for my sake and cause, who visited one another for my sake and cause, I will place them on pulpits, not of wood, not of metal, not of brick and stone, on pulpits of light. Manabira min nur. The pulpit will be made of light. And those Muslims who loved one another, who were unified for my sake, they shall be placed on top of it. Even the prophets and the saints and the martyrs will be envious and jealous of that position and that 
platform that they are upon. This is the hadith, the fundamental hadith that illustrates for us the importance of establishing bonds between the Muslim Ummah, the importance of unity, the importance of helping one another, of loving one another, of striving to aid each other in every single cause that affects us. And these sentiments are found in many verses and many ahadith. Of the verses there, these sentiments are found where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatih. O you who believe, have the fear of Allah as He deserves. And all of you combine together, join hands, wa'atasimu, hold fast and tight to the rope of Allah. And don't be disunited. Don't splinter up into groups. Allah commands the ummah for unity. Allah tells us this is what I want. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah loves for you that you join together and hold hands. And Allah hates that you disunite and splinter up. Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Allah loves that you combine together. Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa." The believers are brothers to one another. What does a brother do? What does your brother do? Your brother monitors your affairs. He sees, is there any need of yours? When you don't have enough food, when you don't have money to pay your rent, you can depend upon your family. You can depend upon your brothers to help you out. You know this, this is the reality, the way that our society functions. Even Muslim, non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. You can count upon your family members to help you out. Allah says, we are all one big family. The Muslim Ummah is one family. All of us are brothers to one another. We help each other out at times of need. Yusuf Estes Prophet, their lives, their prophecy, their family, their enemies, their miracles. Join us for all of this and more on Stories of the Prophet. Inspirations from the Prophets down the ages past in Stories of the Prophets. Tonight at 8 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 9 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic My husband wants to keep divorce. Solution or problem? Join family system. Heaven or hell? Big fat have become the norm. You choose. Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Better Half next on Peace TV. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah commands you that you all be brothers for the sake of Allah. وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانَ Allah wants you all to have these ties of brotherhood amongst the Muslim Ummah. In another beautiful narration, the Prophet wasallam reminded us that you shall never have true Iman until you love one another. You will never reach the level of Iman that Allah loves until you love one another. And these are all evidences, my dear brothers and sisters, that we all know, we're all aware of. Allah wants us to be one Ummah. The Prophet wasallam also forbade splitting up the Ummah for tribal or ethnic reasons. In one hadith, he said, some of the matters of Jahiliyyah will remain in my Ummah. Some of the matters of the days pre-Islam will remain in my Ummah. And one of them, he said, is to be proud of your ancestry, to be boastful of your ancestry. He said, this is something that is Jahili. 
pre-Islamic, paganistic. It should not be in my ummah, but unfortunately it shall remain in my ummah. To be proud of one ancestry means that you consider yourself superior because of your lineage. Because my father was from this place and my grandfather was from that ethnicity and my great-grandfather did this and that. In Islam, all of this is irrelevant in the sight of Allah. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what tribal, ethnic, geographic location you are from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. If we discriminate based upon ethnicity, based upon tribalism, we have fallen into something that is paganistic, jahiliya. And unfortunately, we all know this prejudice still exists in the ummah. Just like the Prophet ﷺ said, that there will remain in my ummah certain things from the times of jahiliya. We are proud because we are from a certain ethnicity, a certain nationality, a certain tribe. We look down upon other ethnicities, other tribes, other skin colors. And all of this has nothing to do with Islam. In the final message that the Prophet ﷺ gave to all of mankind on the farewell pilgrimage, he said, O oh mankind, all of you are from Adam and Adam was from dust. How can you be proud of your ancestry? How can you be boastful? How can you say that you are superior than anyone else when all of you come from the same asl, from the same root, from the same tree, and that is the tree of Adam. And where did Adam come from? Adam came from this ground that you walk on, this dust. Who amongst us aggrandizes dust? Who amongst us thinks that mud and clay is something that is worthy of respect? Well then, have we forgotten we are based from this mud and clay? Allah says in the Quran, Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. From this mud we created you. And to this clay you shall return. And from it once again we shall resurrect you. It is pure folly to consider ourselves better because of our ethnic origins, because of our tribal and ancestral heritage. No. Allah says in the Quran, Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The only means of nobility in the sight of Allah is that of taqwa. The more God consciousness, the more love of Allah, the more piety you have, the more higher you are in the sight of Allah. This is the only means of discrimination in the sight of Allah. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah does not look at your bodies and your skin colors. Allah does not look at your physical appearances. No. Rather, Allah looks at your hearts and your actions. Allah does not look. In other words, He is not concerned with how you look, with what language you speak, with what tribe you came from. This is not anything to do with the judgment of Allah. You will not rise up in Jannah or go down in Jannah or Jahannam just because of your ethnic origins. It is irrelevant completely in the sight of Allah. The only means of superiority in Islam is by God consciousness. What I do with my life, the piety that I inculcate in my daily routine, not what my father did, not what my grandfather did, not what my great-grandfather did, it is irrelevant. What have I done for myself, for Allah, for humanity? All of this will count on my skills. And this is the judgment of Islam. There is no discrimination in Islam at all based upon these temporal, worldly, materialistic differences. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The most pious of you, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah are those who have the most piety. However, at the same time, along with all of these texts of unity, we also have warnings of disunity. We also have a hadith that warn us, that give us the premonition that the future of the ummah shall have much splintering. Realize, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, there was a time in the ummah when there was no ikhtilaf, when there was no different groups. In Urdu we call firqa bazi. 
There was no Firqabazi once upon a time. When was this time? The time of the companions. The companions were one group. There were not different groups amongst them. They were one ummah. So the fact that Muslims would split was something they could not conceive. They could not visualize the ummah breaking up amongst itself. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ had to warn them, Satafteriqu ummati. My ummah will break up into groups, will splinter up into many, many different groups. In one hadith, he said into 73 groups. All of them will be misguided. All of them will be incorrect, except for one of them. It is a warning. It is not a command. The commandments always are for unity. Allah always tells us unify. The Prophet ﷺ always tells us be all together. But the warnings have been given. Despite the command, many of you will fail to live by it. And you shall split into many groups. You shall break up into many different factions. And if we look at the status of the ummah today, we find that there is not a single possible reason for difference except that we have divided upon it. We have divided ethnically. Ethnically. The Pathan looks at the Pashtun in a certain way. The Pashtun looks at the Afghan. The Afghan looks at the Bengali. The Indian looks at the Pakistani. And the Pakistani looks at the Indian. All of them are looking at one another in suspicion, in a sense of condescension, in a sense of arrogance, in a sense of evil. There are prejudices. There are stereotypes. We don't see that he is Muslim. We see that he is Kashmiri or Pakistani or Bengali or whatever we see it. We don't look at the fact that he believes in La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Rather, we judge him based upon the color of a piece of paper he holds in his pocket called the passport. This is the reality of the ummah. We also have divided on theological differences. We have differed about Allah in his names and attributes. We have differed about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his reality. We have differed about issues of fiqh. We have differed about the realities of faith and iman. There is hardly a possible difference of opinion except that the ummah has already splintered upon it. We have divided into national and geographic regions, a concept that was unknown to the Sahaba. There is hardly a means of disunity except that we find it prevalent in the ummah today. So the question arises, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, what do we do when we are faced with this mass of disunity? What do we do in light of the current realistic situation of the ummah that it is being faced? We know that unity is something that we should strive for and aim for. But how do we attain it? And what are those factors that qualify and constitute unity? And this leads me to the second topic. And that is, what is the meaning of unity? What is the meaning of combining our ranks? For some amongst us, unity merely means that all those who profess to be Muslim should come together. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter whether you pray or not, whether you fast or not. It doesn't matter what your theology is. If you say, I am a Muslim, then we must all come together. That is one extreme. The other extreme, and Islam is always in the middle by the way. The other extreme is that every single difference is a reason for me to cut off ties with my Muslim brother. Every single issue becomes an issue of difference. This is the other extreme. So the one extreme, nothing is important as long as you claim Islam. The other extreme, every single issue becomes important, even if it is, relatively speaking, a trivial issue. And as usual, the Muslim ummah should be right in the middle. Meaning, there are some issues that are important. That yes, if somebody believes certain things or does certain practices, then our level of brotherhood will diminish a little bit. And in some cases, our level of brotherhood will be cut off completely. And there are other practices which should be completely ignored when it comes to establishing levels of brotherhood. You see, brothers and sisters, a common mistake that is made by many of us 
is that we presume that Islamic Brotherhood is like a light switch. You either have it on or you have it off. Positive or negative. That is not the case. The brotherhood that we feel for the Muslims is a spectrum. It is not a light switch. It is not black and white. It has millions of shades of gray in the middle. Meaning, it is possible that you love a Muslim specifically more than you love another one because of the good that is in him. And it is possible that you have less of a relationship with another Muslim because of a certain problem, a certain issue than with another Muslim. And once we understand this basic premise that love and relationship with the Muslims is relative, it is partial, it is degreed, and it is not positive or negative. It is not either you have it or not. Then we get to the next question. On what basis do I increase the brotherhood? And on what basis do I diminish and decrease it? When do I have the full level of brotherhood? And when should I diminish that level? And when should I completely ignore and negate it? Uh.